Good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending the uh, 17th yeah. Prophetic Voices Lecture. I'm delighted you could join us here. It is both an honor and a personal pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon for our 17th Annual Prophetic Voices Lecture. The Annual Prophetic Voices Lecture is an opportunity for the Blasi Center here at BC to enable respected and informed public figures to offer prophetic commentary on the major cultural, ethical, political, and religious issues in the American public square. In the 17-year history of this lecture, previous speakers have included Marislav Wolf, Rabbi David Saperstein, Sister Helen Prejean, Robert George of Princeton, Richard Mao, and Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. The bar you see has been set very high, so tonight's speaker will be his, among his equals. E.J. Dion is a political columnist for the Washington Post, and he is also senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution in Washington. He is, as well, as you know, a frequent commentator on politics for National Public Radio, on ABC's This Week, and for MSNBC. He is, as well, a professor of government at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. And quite unsurprisingly, he has been named one of the 25 most influential Washington journalists by the Washington Journal, and one of, in an article entitled Capital Cities Top Journalists, he was also named to that list by Washington Mag Magazine. E.J. was educated at Harvard College, and he was as well a Rhodes Scholar at Bailey, is that correct, at Oxford, uh, before joining the staff of the New York Times, where he covered politics, reporting from a whole slew of places. I, I started following your bio. It was Albany, Washington, Paris, Rome, and Beirut. Really? Beirut? Is that true? In Beirut. He's the author of six books, including most recently, Why the Right Went Wrong, Conservatism from Goldwater to the Tea Party and Beyond, as, as well as his current New York Times and Washington Post bestsellers, which, which was co-authored with Norman Ornstein and Thomas Mann, and it has the wonderful name of One Nation After Trump, A Guide for the Perplexed, the Disillusioned, the Disparate, and the Not Yet Deported. <laughs> Tonight, in a very timely way, he will speak on truth and lies in a polarized time. I'm honored to introduce you, E.J. Dion. Thank you, Father Massa. I always um, like to say when somebody gives me such a generous introduction, it's way better than the one I got once in the Midwest that ended. And now, for the latest dope from Washington, here is E.J. Dion. So, <clears throat> bless you, uh, bless you for that. And um, I, it's a real pleasure to be here at BC. I am a kid from Fall River. Some of you may know uh, Fall River. So I must report the most important news of the day, which is that the Red Sox having tied it in the bottom of the ninth, won the game 3-2 to two in the 12th inning. So, um, and I, I would use that to note that I, I, I always like to say in talks outside of uh, the New England area that the most unpopular thing I'm going to say is that I'm a New England Patriots fan. But there's one place where I can say that without too much fear of contradiction. And I always like to say that I absolutely loved the flake game. Uh, and the reason why I love Deflategate is because I learned the joys of being a Fox News commentator, which is that I actually didn't care what the facts were. <laughs> I just knew which side I was on. <laughs> um, although, as true Patriots fans, we all know that the ideal gas law proves that we were fine and there was nothing, nothing there. Um, I, it's a real pleasure to be here. My, many thanks to... Uh, Father Massa, who's doing wonderful things with the Boise Center, to uh, Susan Richard and uh, Jack Newley for organizing logistics. I particularly want to shout out my friends, uh, K uh, Kathy Cavani and Kay Schlossman. It's very nice, very distinguished members of this faculty. Uh, Kathy, relatively recently, uh, and Kay for some years now, if I am correct. Uh, here 24. 24. 24. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, um, she was, um, was ten when she came. Yeah, she, yeah the um, uh, you came with the cameraman when you were the, the um, 
Uh, but it's it's uh, very good to uh, very good to be here. Um, I do uh, love being back in Massachusetts, in my hometown. It was often said that the uh, operative political slogan was "Vote for the Kennedy of your choice, but vote." <laughs> I love the fact that in the state of Massachusetts, a gentleman who worked in the Gillette factory named John F. Kennedy put his name on the ballot and proceeded to get elected state treasurer solely because his name was John F. Kennedy. <laughs> and actually, the Democratic Party was so worried that he was going to win the governorship that they qualified two other John Kennedys for the ballot <laughs> just to split uh, the, uh, the uh, John uh, Kennedy uh, vote. There is uh, one of my favorite Massachusetts uh, stories is about a man who's from Springfield uh, who's preparing his will and um, he, um, the lawyer is going through the will, and it all makes sense, except this guy from Springfield wants to be buried in South Boston, for, you know, 70 miles away from where he grew up. And um, it happened that it was in Billy Bulger's district. Some of you may be old enough to remember Billy Bulger, um, you know, a district that was known to produce 120% of the vote, if that was <laughs> what was required. And so Laura said, you know, this all makes sense, but why do you want to be buried 70 miles from where you're born? And the man looked at his lawyer and said, look, I see no reason why my death should deprive me of my right to participate in the democratic <laughs> process. Uh, so I do feel uh, very, uh, very at home here. Um, I want to um, talk tonight about truth and lies in a polarized time. Um, and I, I, want to, I want to sort of do three things. I want to talk about truth and lies, I want to talk a bit about populism, and then I want to talk about religion's role uh, in um, all of this. Um, it's a useful, if imperfect, description of the challenge uh, facing uh, American democracy today. Um, it's obvious that uh, President Trump capitalized on long-term anti-media and anti-elite trends within the conservative movement and on broader changes in the way we consume uh, the media uh, to cast anyone who challenged him as enemies of the people, uh, a term uh, that uh, Khrushchev banned in Russia. Uh, it's worth uh, remembering. Um, and the attack on truth is just part of a larger war against liberal democracy that is being waged by authoritarian populists, and note it's important to put that adjective in front of populists, as I will get to, uh, in the United States and throughout the West. Um, and in keeping with this lecture being part of the Prophetic Voices series, I'm very honored to be on that distinguished list, um, we must also uh, grapple with the complicated role that religion and religious people played in the rise of authoritarian populism. Uh, but also that the role that they are playing and may come to play, I'd like to hope, um, uh, in an even greater way as the years go by, in reestablishing the value of truth uh, and in giving new life um, to our sense of uh, democratic rights and democratic obligations, uh, both. Um, I want to first examine the crisis of truth and lies in America and then uh, consider uh, populism. Um, Trump's attacks on society's information gatherers and accountability seekers uh, began long before he was elected. Um, but becoming president did nothing to mellow him. Um, his first attack came within hours of his inauguration. You might remember this. Uh, Trump's crowd was about average, not minuscule, but not, uh, to use one of his favorite words, huge. Um, and the photographic evidence made clear that compared with the throngs who had gathered to celebrate uh, both of uh, Barack Obama's uh, inaugurations, Trump's turnout was much smaller. Uh, but plain and convincing evidence did not stop Trump. Uh, he insisted otherwise. We had the biggest audience in the history of inaugural speeches, he declared. Remember, this is his first day in office, and he was furious about confronting any contradiction. Uh, he was inaugurated on Friday, and it fell to Sean Spicer, his new press secretary, to call in the press the next day for a dressing down. Uh, Spicer carried out his first assignment loyally, uh, but defending the president's factually indefensible claim was an impossible task, and 
a very unfortunate opening act for a new White House spokesman, whom I should report went to the same Benedictine high school that I did. Um, he, um, and, um, he did the best he could, but he would eventually leave uh, Trump's uh, service. Um, the statement that would define uh, Trump world's attitude toward the truth came the day after on Sunday morning when Kellyanne Conway, Trump's senior counselor, appeared on NBC's Meet the Press, challenged by the host Chuck Todd as to why Spicer was asked to go to the podium and offer Peyton on truths. Conway answered with a formulation that might have embarrassed George Orwell had he included it in 1984, which, by the way, became Amazon's number one bestseller during Trump's first weeks in office. Um, Sean Spicer, our press secretary, she declared, gave alternative facts. Alternative facts, an astonished Chuck Todd said. Alternative facts aren't facts, they're falsehoods. Yep, there we are. Uh, in his powerful book on tyranny, the historian Timothy Snyder offered 20 lessons that 20th century history uh, has to teach us in the Trump era. Lesson number 10 was at once basic and essential, um, and I suppose perfect for a Catholic institution. Lesson number 10 was believe in truth. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom, Snyder insisted. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power. You submit to tyranny when you renounce the difference between what you want to hear and what is actually the case. Uh, today, the fight for truth may be the most important struggle of all. Now, the journey to alternative facts and to what would be called uh, the post-truth world began long ago. Uh, it involves all sorts of factors, including the severe financial challenges uh, to traditional media institutions, the rise of alternative outlets, particularly on the right, um, whose power was never matched by the liberal uh, alternatives. Uh, beginning in the Nixon Agnew era, the right made the liberal media its enemy. Uh, remember, nattering nabobs of negativism. I have to say that Spiro Agnew's attacks on the media were actually more interesting than President Trump's uh, attacks on the media. Um, and over the next four decades, mistrust hardened into a deep hostility that Trump both aggravated and exploited. Um, social media made it ever easier for citizens to inhabit their own information worlds, free not only from challenges to their views, but also from correction of error uh, and misunderstanding. Uh, at this point, I must say, as a columnist, I actually love getting hate mail because hate mail shows that some people are trying to grapple with opinions on the other side, and I'm actually grateful for that. My favorite, by the way, uh, was a, actually a fairly friendly one compared to some of them. It began, Dear Mr. Dion, are you as dumb in person? <laughs> and so you may not get anything else out of this talk but at least you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. <laughs> um, the uh, technology uh, made uh, everything more efficient, including the spreading of lies, and including the ability to inhabit our own uh, information worlds. Uh, in this new environment, the dedication of the older news outlets, the established newspapers and television networks, to balance uh, became more and more complicated. What balance was owed to falsehood? What was to be done if one political candidate was outlandishly and shamelessly willing to make up facts and level a steady stream of unsubstantiated charges, while the other candidate was merely flawed in the way all candidates are flawed? And how could television executives, particularly those running the cable outlets, resist a man who was to ratings as our dear Boston Red Sox are to victories in the early parts of this season. I promise that's my last Red Sox <laughs> reference. Um, uh, it turned out that they couldn't resist Trump. Um, it needs to be said that concern over the fate of truth and fact is not a sudden preoccupation of the Trump era. Uh, Michiku Kakutani, uh, the New York Times literary critic who just stepped down fairly recently, wrote a really powerful essay in 1994, so I think we've been grappling with this for a long time, and she wrote that throughout our culture, 
the old notions of truth and knowledge are in danger of being replaced by the new ones of opinion, perception, and credibility. Kakutani warned of a universe in which truths are replaced by opinions as citizens become increasingly convinced of the authenticity of their own emotions and increasingly inclined to trust their ideological reflexes. The problems we face today have been a long uh, time in coming. Now, as someone who makes his living as an opinionated newspaper columnist, uh, as a columnist, I want to make an additional point. One of the most widely cited observations uh, of the last 20 years, um, uh, at a time when even facts seem to have a political e allegiance, is the late uh, Senator Daniel Patrick uh, Moynihan's famous coinage, everyone is entitled to his own opinions, but not to his own facts. Um, I think there is a corollary to Moynihan's rule that we need to enforce now. Um, opinion journalism cannot be called journalism if it is not based on fact. Uh, I think we need a standard for opinion journalism that applies the same, uh, the same rules and the same demands. Um, in our time, a defense of, uh, of factually based opinionated commentary is as important as defending traditional reporting itself. Now, in an ideal world, a journalism of verification of fact could live, would live happily side by side with an enriched and, again, factual opinionated sector. Uh, there are genuine grounds for hope that this might yet be our future, uh, but technology does not stand still. There will continue to be more opinion available than ever, combined with a greater capacity on the part of individuals to select only the point of view they share, and in the name of enhancing the online experience, a tendency of social media platforms to push people toward others who are like them and who agree with them. Uh, the media environment, in other words, was perfectly set up uh, for a man like Donald Trump. Many conservatives had already cut themselves off from the mainstream media. New forms of right-wing media, notably Steve Bannon's Breitbart News, could take advantage of this by being more aggressive than ever in promoting not only alternative storylines, common enough in any political campaign, but also non-factual phony narratives, alternative facts. Uh, this was a conclusion of a study published in March 2017 by the Breckman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard uh, at MIT Center for Civic Media. Their research into 1.25 million stories published online between April 1st, 2015 and Election Day concluded, and I quote, that a right-wing media network anchored around Breitbart developed as a distinct and insulated media system using social media as a back, the backbone to transmit a hyper-partisan perspective to the world. The pro-Trump media sphere appears to have not only successfully set the agenda for the conservative media sphere, sphere but also strongly influenced the broader media agenda, in particular coverage of Hillary Clinton. Now think of that, that is a fascinating thing. It's one thing for this media sphere to preach to the choir, but this study found that their preaching actually affected the mainstream coverage. Um, and selective consumption of information, uh, often in quotation marks, was especially common on the right. Again, their report. While concerns about political and media polarizations, polarization online are longstanding, our study suggests that polarization was asymmetric. Pro-Clinton audiences were highly attentive to traditional media outlets, which continued to be the most prominent outlets across the public sphere, alongside more left-oriented online sites. But pro-Trump audiences paid the majority of their attention to polarized outlets that have developed recently, many of them only since the 2008 election season. <coughs> The study points to a central truth that many would prefer to obey. The problem presented by Trumpism is not the creation of broad general trends that have nothing to do with party or ideology. It is not the product of technology itself. Uh, the loss of a common conversation is largely the results of habits on the political right deeply ingrained since the 1960s. Trumpism was not created by liberals or moderates, even if liberals and moderates certainly can be faulted 
for not seeing the threat, clearly responding to it adequately, or fully responding to the discontents that fed the Trump movement. Um, an April 2017 uh, ABC News Washington Post poll further confirmed that conservative attacks on mainstream media had dramatically shaped the perception of Trump's voters. According to the poll, 78%, 78 of Trump supporters thought that news organizations regularly produced false stories, but only 17% thought the same of the Trump administration. Um, on uh, his liberal plumbline blog at the Washington Post, my colleague Greg Sargent argued that it was hard to avoid the conclusion <clears throat> that Trump is accomplishing one of his key goals, in the minds of his voters at least, his project is to obliterate shared agreement on the legitimate institutional role of the media in informing the citizen and in informing the citizenry. Uh, his uh, his project pr proceeds apace. Um, now, defending the work of those who are engaged in establishing verifiable truths, whether they are in journalism or in government agencies that collect and disseminate accurate information, or whether they are um, scientists and others in the academy who subject their work to critical scrutiny, um, it is essential, uh, these are essential to carrying out the tasks of democracy. Disorienting the public by blurring the lines between facts and falsehood, Alexander Hamilton warned us long ago, is the trick of the despot whose object is to throw things into confusion that he may ride the storm and direct the world with. Um, I wonder what Alexander Hamilton would make of President Trump. Um, he seemed to foresee him. Um, it should now be clear uh, that false balance does not serve the truth, defensiveness does not preserve journalism's values, and trying to appease critics who have no interest in the truth only compromises journalism's purposes. But the dangerous aspects of Trumpism, including the demonization of the media, and the proliferation of fake news are not confined to the United States at this uh, moment. <clears throat> they are part of a uh, global phenomenon in which populist and pseudo-populist strongmen have come to power promising to shake up the political uh, status quo. Uh, now, one idea I was introduced to in graduate school has come back to me again and again, and particularly in recent years, it is the, uh, the importance of recognizing that there are essentially contested concepts. Uh, these are concepts whose very definitions are under constant challenge uh, and debate. <clears throat> I think populism is one of those essentially contested concepts. Um, it is not simply <clears throat> a matter of whether it is a good or a bad thing. Uh, it's also the fact that scholars, political activists, journalists, and politicians cannot agree on exactly what populism uh, is. Uh, people's value judgments often depend on their definitions. My friend, the historian Michael Kazin, underscored how broadly the term could be applied in his 1995 book, The Populist Persuasion. <coughs> I'm sorry about my cough. Um, when he cited a comedian who said in 1992, to be a populist, all you have to be is popular. Uh, would that it were that simple. Um, the theme of this lecture series is prophetic voices. And of course, religion and prophecy are just as uh, difficult uh, to define uh, as populism. Um, religion can be a hellish thicket of intellectual difficulties or a heavenly opportunity for exploring human motivation. Uh, face it, human beings have been worrying about religion even longer than they have been worrying about populism. Religion can be royalist or populist, democratic or authoritarian. It can be this worldly political or as otherworldly apolitical as you want it to be. My own Catholic Church celebrates a Sunday in honor of Christ the King and a feast day in honor of Saint Joseph the Worker. Uh, the political implications of these two celebrations are as different as their political origins. On the one side, a monarch, uh, a monarch. On the other side, a potentially populist or perhaps even social democratic carpenter. 
um, viewing Jesus as a carpenter or a king can actually make a big difference in your perception. Uh, even if our friends in the building trades might ask, what's the problem? Um, precisely because there are a number of populisms, there are uh, many varieties of, religion, of political action uh, rooted in religious faith and religious identity. And so the relationship between religion and populism is always complicated. Uh, one might be, uh, begin with a simple rule of thumb. When religion is viewed principally as a call to justice and reform, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, Martin Luther King declared, quoting the prophet Amos. When religion is this call to justice, it is the ally of progressive movements and democratic forms of populism. When religion, on the other side, is seen primarily as a form of personal identity that reinforces an us holding off a threatening and probably sinful them, it is usually a prop for reactionary forms of populism, of those offering a narrow definition of who actually constitutes the people. This is religion invoked against the infidel or the secular elites and in support of a tribe that often sees itself as beleaguered or threatened. Uh, it is the Christianity, I, I am sorry to say, of the Reverend Robert Jeffress, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, who explained his support for Trump in 2016 this way, and I quote the Reverend Jeffress, frankly, I want the meanest, toughest son of a gun I can find. And I think that's the feeling of a lot of evangelicals. They don't want a Casper milk toast as the leader of the free world. Uh, he, meaning Trump, has said that uh, he believes that Christians in Christianity have been marginalized. He always, this is still Jeffress. He always gets a laugh when he says, we're going to start saying Merry Christmas in America again. We all know what he's talking about. Now notice here that I have already made a distinction between two forms of populism, uh, and there are certainly more than just two. Politicians of diverse ideological persuasions and levels of attachment to liberal democracy have long denounced established economic, cultural, and political elites while portraying themselves as champions of the people. Um, scholars have struggled to define when this behavior constitutes populism, and when it does not. Uh, they have also sought to apply the term beyond its American origins uh, in the uh, broadly um, left of center People's Party in the, in the 19th century to explain the modern phenomenon whereby populist leaders with widely varying um, ideologies have come to power in countries around the world. Um, it is worth noting that our 19th and early 20th century American populists regularly invoke their faith, and none more so than our most populist, uh, a prominent populist, um, who was also well known as a fundamentalist Christian, William Jennings Bryan. His rhetoric and his politics are incomprehensible without, under, uh, without an understanding of his devotion to Christianity. Recall his most famous speech. Having behind us the commercial interests and the labor interests and all the toiling masses, Brian declared at the 1896 Democratic Convention, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. I wish I could have been at that convention <laughs> to hear uh, that speech. This was old time populism, and it was also old time uh, religion. The story of Jesus who threw the money changers out of the temple, a recurring theme in populist rhetoric, is invoked in the name of the toiling masses. Michael Kazin, who is also Brian's biographer, got at the capaciousness and complexity of populism when he urged advocates of change to stress the harmonious, hopeful, and pragmatic aspects of populist language and to disparage the mean, meaner ones. Yes, you can take populism in many directions. Uh, because the meaner aspects of populism have come to the fore in movements of the European right, like France's National Front, populism is more a term of opprobrium in Europe 
than it is uh, in the United States. Jan Werner, Muller, uh, Jan Werner Muller, a political scientist at Princeton, who is particularly interested in European and Latin American examples of populism, has argued that the labels should be reserved for this malevolent force uh, in modern democracies. It is not sufficient for a political actor to be critical of elites to count as populist in Mueller's telling. All politicians want to appeal to the people and to speak of how sensitive they are to the thoughts and feelings of common men and women. Uh, and many have authentic ambitions to speak up on behalf of those who have been ill-represented and left behind. But um, Werner Muller writes that only populists can claim that they and they alone represent the people, or as Trump has put it, I alone can fix it. Uh, Muller sees populism as an exclusionary form of identity politics and a danger to democracy. Now, I take Mueller's warnings about the dangers of populism as a form of exclusionary politics seriously, but I share my Kazin's view that it is only when leftists and liberals themselves talked in populist ways, hopeful, expansive, even romantic, that they were able to lend their politics a majoritarian cast and help markedly to improve the common welfare. And I am sympathetic as well to the historian Rick Perlstein's instinct that as long as there are elites making policy decisions in unaccountable ways that favor the few over the many, there should be populist movements and will be populist movements. And what's more, we should encourage populist movements. But again, we should do this while being mindful of Mueller's insight that authoritarian forms of populism exist and that the tip off to the char their character is their effort to offer exceptionally narrow definitions of the people restricted by race or by culture, or by gender, or by religion. We need to acknowledge populism's democratic impulses while resisting the forms that my colleague William Galston in his, uh, in his uh, very recent book describes as anti-pluralist. A populism whose aim is to include the excluded can be compatible with pluralism. A populism that proposes new forms of exclusion cannot. We need the same sense of discernment when it comes to what the theologian Harvey Cox described as people's religion. I draw this term from his 1973 book, uh, The Seduction of the Spirit, a wonderful idea, where he discussed the use and misuse of people's religion. Cox defines people's religion as the collective story of a whole people. It includes both, and I'm quoting Cox here, it includes both the folk religion of ordinary people in its unsophisticated form and the popular religion that occurs outside formal ecclesiastical institutions and ad hoc rituals and do-it-yourself liturgies. Like all who stress liberation, Cox invokes the Exodus story and links it to the Easter story. Exodus points to the emancipation of men, um, and we would say men and women now, from, uh, from political and economic bondage. Easter, the resurrection of Christ, is the Christian parallel of the Exodus. Easter faith celebrates the liberation of all men and women from sin and death. Sin, he says, is understood as whatever chains people to the past and death as whatever terrifies them about the future. God is that power which, despite all setbacks, never admits to final defeat. Now, this is obviously a political theology of the left, and Cox was a close student and friend to many of the liberation theologians in Latin America. Thus did Gustavo Gutierrez and Leonardo Boff and other liberation theologians stress the link between liberation from sin and liberation from oppression. If I may interrupt for a moment to tell one of my favorite stories as a Vatican correspondent, I happened to be covering the Vatican when Leonardo Boff found himself condemned uh, by Cardinal Ratzinger, then later Pope Benedict, uh, when he was at the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Um, and Boff had actually subjected the church itself to a Marxist analysis, which didn't go over very well in the Vatican, <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, and you can tell I had an American source in the Vatican uh, because the fourth paragraph of the New York Times story that I wrote uh, quoted a Vatican official, I think, an aide, I think I identified him as an aide to Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, he said, Boff, 
makes Rome sound like a four-letter word. Uh, and he kind of well summarized the Vatican critique of Leonardo Boff, uh, who has become since very friendly with Pope Francis. Um, the, um, uh, to quote Gutierrez, he said, the denunciation of injustice implies the rejection of the use of Christianity to legitimize the established order. Uh, Gutierrez also said that the God of Exodus is the God of history and of political liberation more than he is the God of nature. Uh, I raise Cox and the liberation theologians first because their witness can be seen as a form of populism, a form we ignore at the moment uh, with the stress on right-wing manifestations of religious populism. Many of our early 19th and 20th century populists, as we've seen, would relate to much of this language, even if their theology might have been more orthodox or traditional. Uh, if we need to think about more than one kind of populism, we also need to think of more than one kind of political theology, and thus more than one kind of religious populism. Now, Harvey Cox stressed something else, that religion, including, including people's religion, uh, can be manipulated. This is what he is referring to in the title of his book, The Seduction of the Spirit. Uh, the Seduction of the Spirit, he writes, is the calculated twisting of people's natural and healthy religious instincts for purposes of control and domination. It is the cruelest abuse of religion because it slyly enlists people in their own manipulation. Now, those of us on the progressive side might well see Trump's success with evangelical conservatives as a classic instance of the seduction of the spirit. But the rallying of conservative evangelicals to Trump, as the Reverend Jefferson's comments suggest, can also be analyzed as a form of reaction against the loss of cultural dominance as part of a long trend of white Southern conservatives away from the Democratic Party because of reaction around race and civil rights, and also because of the increasing dominance of abortion and gay marriage as the issues of primary concern uh, to conservative Christians, both Catholic and Protestant. Uh, to note the link between the religious right and racial reaction is not a slander, nor does it deny the existence of authentic religious feeling <coughs> among Trump's voters or religious conservatives generally. It is simply a matter of history and a reflection on the nature of the Trump campaign, which trafficked more explicitly with racial politics than either John McCain's campaign in 2008 or Mitt Romney's campaign in 2012. And it is worth noting that the galvanizing event in the history of the religious right was the Internal Revenue Service's decision to revoke the tax exempt uh, status of Bob Jones University and other religious schools that discriminated against non-whites. The religious liberty slogan was then implicit, explicitly linked to segregation, and the historian Randall Balmer has suggested that in 2016, the religious conservative movement had gone full uh, circle. Um, an American populism uh, that has been uh, directed uh, against banks and the wealthy and concentrated economic power uh, can thus also be turned against concentrated cultural power, uh, including the power of the mainstream media. And it was this sort of populism that was practiced most beginning in the Nixon era and reaching its apogee in the Reagan era. Reagan appealed openly for working class votes and his famous invocation of family work neighborhood spoke to those whom the Republican speechwriter William Gavin called street corner conservatives. Hollywood television producers, long-haired college students, government bureaucrats, public interest lawyers, college professors, and journalists could all be lumped together not simply as groups but as a class uh, that was deserving of a comeuppance. Uh, Trump era populism has built on this work, but it has a distinctive quality. Uh, it imports uh, a hard edge uh, from the European far uh, right. Um, some of its most extreme advocates actually use the words blood and soil, a sinister phrase given its associations with the 1930s. And it has gained a following precisely because American demography and America's cultural turn has given conservative white Christians grounds to worry 
that, as many of them have put it, my children will not inherit the country I grew up with. My friend and colleague Robert Jones published a book last year called The End of White Christian America, which did not render a value judgment, but simply looked at the facts. <clears throat> Two trends, long-term immigration from countries outside of Europe and the abandonment of religious affiliation by upwards of 40%, 40% of the millennial generation have turned white Christians into an actual minority of our nation's population. Many white evangelical Christians have an intimation of this, and it's one reason they are happy to hear a presidential candidate defend their right to say Merry Christmas. Uh, as the Reverend Jeffress said, we all know what he's talking about. If I may speak for a moment as a Christian who believes in liberal democracy and whose views can fairly be described as social democratic, I believe that it is essential that Christians battle against all forms of populist nationalism that are dangerous to human freedom, to religious and ethnic minorities, and to the common good. As Samuel Moyne has written, serious Christians had to disentangle themselves from the nationalistic populism of the 1930s, sometimes too late. To do so, they emphasized human dignity as the touchstone for the more humane future they hoped to build. It was vague and ill-defined, but it captured something sacred about the human person that ought not to be violated. Those of us who are Catholics, in my persuasion, are heartened that Pope Francis has provided a strong and clear voice for the defense of the dignity of every human being, and especially of the poorest uh, and the marginalized. My friend Kathy Cavani, whom I mentioned earlier, offered a brilliant formulation of the problem we face in the title of her recent book, Prophecy Without Contempt. We badly need prophecy. We don't need and must resolutely avoid contempt toward our brothers and sisters, our fellow citizens, even when we think they are very wrong. Religion's most powerful public role, Kaveny writes, involves prophetic indictment of our shortcomings. And she holds up Dr. King and Abraham Lincoln as models of this approach. Kathy makes her point powerfully by noting how changing one letter in a word can make an enormous moral difference. This is one of my favorite things you do in the book, Kathy. Uh, the word condemn with a D uh, means to pronounce an adverse judgment on, to express strong disapproval of. That is the job of the prophet. Lincoln condemned slavery and was right to do so. Dr. King condemned segregation, discrimination, and economic injustice, and he was right to do so. But there was another side to Lincoln and King, and Kaveny underscores this by contrasting the word condemn with a D uh, to the root word of contempt with a T, contemn. This involves holding or treating others, as she wrote, as of little account or as vile and worthless uh, as unimportant or of small value. As Kaveny argues, to treat one's political interlocutors as vile or worthless is to risk undermining their equal status as participants in our com political community. It is to treat them as unworthy of citizenship, as people who must be pruned from our common endeavor. Now, Kaveny also sees King and Lincoln as models because even as they called out evil, they maintained a lively sense of humility. They understood the limits of their own knowledge and acknowledged their own moral shortcomings. They displayed, again as she put it, social humility regarding the status of other peoples, including one's enemies and God's affections. In other words, they didn't consign their foes to hell. Um, and if I may speak as a journalist, although now one of the sort free to express opinions of all kinds, I think that this upsurge of populism should push us not only to advocate vociferously for freedom of the press, for freedom of expression and for the truth, but also to report on and understand the sources of discontent and the hurt that are producing this populist surge. It is important to disentangle real prejudice and bigotry, which should be identified and called out fearlessly from the frustrations that are sometimes channeled into bigotry, uh, but have roots 
in Injustice and what Richard Sennett and Jonathan Cobb memorably call the hidden injuries of class. Uh, we should not be fearful or condescending about the many forms of populism that are rooted in a democratic civic nationalism. The historian Gary Gerstle defined these as a belief in the fundamental equality of all human beings in every individual's inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and in a democratic government that derives its legitimacy from the people's consent. This populism seeks, uh, speaks for what is best in the American idea. Uh, in examining populist forms of religion, people's religion in Cox's phrase, we should be here, eager to hear people's stories to learn how and why the sacred is mobilized into politics. Again, we need to be distinct, we need to distinguish between using faith as a social marker to divide and exclude uh, and invoking religiously rooted principles on behalf of human dignity and humankind's constant search for meaning, belonging, and fellowship. To bring these stories to the surface is to push against the untruths that are told about religion and religious people in the service of narrow political agendas. When Martin Luther King invoked the prophet Amos to be demand that justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, he reminded his secular friends and allies that our religious traditions often do nurture the seeds of liberation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian who was killed because of his participation in the plot to kill Hitler, offered all of us guidance on how to live, but in the process, he provided an enlightening model um, of, for all of us engaged uh, in politics and all of us simply as citizens. Bonhoeffer wrote that we must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or omit to do and more in light of what they suffer. Uh, if we are looking for a starting point in our efforts to understand the difficult times in which we find ourselves, we could do far worse than this. I want to close with a story <coughs> about my son. Um, my son decided uh, uh, that he wanted to uh, take a year off to do a number of things, and one of them was to do um, some organizing against President Trump. Uh, and he uh, spent his time uh, in uh, Connecticut, uh, essentially trying to turn anti-Trump feeling uh, into local political activism. And the fact is, right now, uh, the Democratic Party is the party that stands against President Trump, and even some of my most conservative friends are now hoping for Democratic victories uh, this uh, fall. And so he was doing a lot of canvassing, and uh, he said that the entire effort, the entire canvassing effort, was worth it for one experience, even though he had a number of good uh, experiences. Um, it was when he knocked on the door, um, and a man a answered. Um, it was an African American man, and he was a very serious but friendly person. And my son started engaging him about the election. And at one point, my son said, are you going to be out to vote on Tuesday? They were worried because the polling place in this precinct had been moved. And so they were going and trying to tell all the voters where it had gone to. And he said, are you going to be voting this Tuesday? And the man looked very seriously at my son. And he said, it's our job. And I think that man has spoken, that man speaks for me for the rest of uh, 2018, and he may speak for me for a long time to come. Right now, and I think most of the time, but especially now, it is our job to be civically engaged. It is our job to be politically engaged. It's our job to persuade, to organize, to listen, and to vote. It's our job to defend democracy and to defend liberty and justice for all. It's our job because we are Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. Uh, as always, lively. <coughs> Everything we hope. Um, 
you touched on a number of important things, and I just want to raise a couple, and then we'll take questions from the audience. A number of uh, journalists have, of course, sort of tried to react to Trump and try to press forward. I love the fact that the New York Times now has a fact check sort of like column where they sort of like, President Trump said this, and this is what it actually, these are actually the data. Other people uh, have become very sort of uh, dour in their uh, predictions. And I was thinking a, a month into the presidency, David Brooks, who's someone I read, I disagree with a lot of what he says, but I read with him, I read him regularly. He basically, David Brooks in his column basically said, it's the end of the republic. That um, the truth and the lies are so mixed up and the polarization is now so strong that it wasn't clear to him that there's a path back. And the, and the, the example he used was Italy, um, that, that after all the nonsense that went on in Italian presidential politics, he said Italy would probably never go back to sort of a, basically a centrist kind of uh, government style where people can disagree with each other respectfully. I'm sure you talked to David Brooks. What, what's your answer to someone like Brooks? Actually, David and I have been uh, talking about politics on NPR. We just realized when Robert Siegel retired, because he looked it up, we've been doing it for 18 years. So I know David really well. It's just one funny story. I wrote a book a few years back where I spent a lot of time uh, looking at the American Whigs. And I came into NPR one day, and I said, David, this book was worth doing if only because I finally figured out why you are entirely crosswise to current American politics. You are the last living, surviving American Whig. Um, and actually, for those of you who read David's column, I urge you to read it carefully, uh, because he really is a kind of Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln Whig in his underlying uh, politics. And I, I remember one time, David and I sort of sometimes agree and sometimes disagree. Um, but uh, I, David said something that I disagreed with, and I couldn't resist saying on the air, I said, you know, what David would have said on a good day, and then I <laughs> went, express my view. Um, the, I'm, not, I, I'm not at that as pessimistic about the Republic. Uh, now, uh, I, that comes with a warning. I should carry a warning label. A uh, very dear friend of mine, and also of uh, Kathy's, Peggy Seinfeld, who was the editor of Commonweal, um, once accused me of being a feliciopath, uh, which I think means you're kind of a glass one tenth full person, you know. Uh, and so I, I, I give you that warning label on me. Um, I think there are some things that may be lost that are hard to reclaim. Um, I think some of our influence in the world will be hard to reclaim, uh, particularly in Asia. Uh, I think that. You, when you release the furies of um, what is acceptable to say uh, when it comes to prejudice and bigotry, it's hard to pull those back. Um, it is not political correctness to believe that there really is something fundamentally wrong with openly racist speech or openly sexist speech. It's just decency. Uh, and I think when you let those go, uh, when you break the habits of politeness, of basic civic politeness, that's hard to fully put back in the bottle. Although, when you look at our history of racism and sexism, we made a lot of progress before. We just have to go back to work uh, on on those things. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, and and so I think Trump is a danger because he's also introduced a kind of autocratic. Uh, voice in our politics um, that uh, American politicians just typ typically avoided. And there is something useful about paying homage to a Democratic and a Republican tradition, even if you don't fully mean it, you know, the, what vice, uh, price vice pays to virtue. When you completely break that and say things like only I can fix it or call the press the enemy of the people, which is a phrase, by the way, the Khrushchev ban. Uh, it was a Stalin phrase, and he thought that it was too authoritarian, so when was Khrushchev was a dictator. Um, you know, again, it's hard to put that back in the model. On the other hand, um, there are signs of the civic antibodies that American public life has within it. I don't think of them simply as the Constitution's guarantees, because you need actors willing to use the Constitution's power to check 
uh, illegitimate authority, and at the moment, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of reluctance to do that among most uh, Republicans in Congress. Um, but when you look at the kind of organization, I like telling my son's story there, not only because he's my son and I love him, but also because um, there are a lot of kids doing that kind of thing, or young adults doing that kind of thing, or a lot of older adults doing that kind of thing. My friend, friend of some of us here, Theda Scotchpole over at Harvard, has been doing a project in eight counties across four states that voted uh, for Donald Trump. And as of a few months ago, she had already identified in these Trump counties 10 organizations formed since the election to fight back uh, against uh, President Trump. Interestingly, they were all led or co-led by women. Many of these women came out of mainline Protestant churches. Um, and in, Athena says that most of the Bernie Hillary things, fights we talk about, were really not present. They had a priority, and that priority was to push back against this um, uh, particular uh, regime or, or leadership we have now. Um, so I think we've, you know, Trump has forced us uh, to rediscover the urgency of small d democratic action, uh, and that may be his one gift to us in the long term um, if we use that democratic action to throw him out of office. Is, is, it, is there a polarization on the left as well as on the right going on in terms of, of, of the certain followers of, of Bernie and others who, who say that the Democratic <coughs> Party answering Trump has not gone far enough to the left, is not radical enough in challenging this. So that's the thing that worries me about the midterms. Well, I think a couple of things happened. I think in a way, reality shifted some to the left after uh, the 2008 economic crash. Uh, and I think that Hillary Clinton, who ran um, in 2016 was probably to the left of the Hillary Clinton who ran uh, in 2008 um, because the basic <laughs> principles she espoused um, in 2008 um, really um, required her and pretty much everybody else to move to a more skeptical view of how uh, unrestricted capitalism uh, could operate. So to that extent, I think there's been a move to the left. There's clearly been a move to the left in the country on gay marriage. I mean, a radical change in public opinion from 2008 uh, to uh, the present uh, moment. Um, and that's another piece of a general uh, movement to the left. Um, yes, there are differences, and you're seeing it in some primaries. You're seeing these differences play out. Um, although what strikes me is how much, um, in a way, you might, after a confrontation like Hillary Bernie, uh, expect more of that. Um, and what I've been struck by looking around the country at the either the nature of the primaries that are happening or primaries that aren't happening uh, is that there has been less contention of that kind uh, than uh, you might have expected. Um, and that that's because of the priority that people are placing on putting a, using these elections to put a check on Trump. Now, I think there will be a big argument in the party between uh, you know, 2018 and 2020, but the multiplicity of candidates, I mean, you might need a stadium to include all of the potential candidates, which, by the way, I don't think is a bad thing. Um, means that you will not have a kind of straight up, simple left-right face-off. I think you're, going to, you're actually going to have a more complicated uh, debate, which I think will have the virtue of preventing a sharp clash. Having said all that, there's no denying that there are these differences. There will be these arguments. Um, but I guess I've been struck by the fact that they have been less sharply drawn because I think of the priority really is pretty broadly, first in the Democratic Party, but then I think across the center and the left to put a check on Trump through these elections. Right. Questions that you may have from the audience. Some of you are specialists in politics. And then, oh, please. Awesome. Yeah. Can you, would you mind saying who you are and just like to know who you are? Because you were nice to come. <laughs> OK, well, I'm a, a news junkie and a member of the community here, but I'm not really connected to the college. Well, that's, it's nice of you to come. It just so happened that today I was reading uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. And it relates to what you said about condemn versus contempt. 
because it made me even more um, pessimistic about the future here. And what he said was there is a professor who's been studying family relationships at Stanford for maybe 20 years, 25 years, and he would take each person, the husband and the wife, talking about some subject. And it got down to the point where within a few seconds, he could tell if that couple was going to be married in 15 years from then. And the single most potent thing was contempt. And I think it just fits with what you're saying, that if we treat each other with contempt, how are we ever going to talk to each other? Okay. See, Kathy, how powerful this uh, yeah. play <laughs> with D's and T's is? That's, uh, D's and T's. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I found that so enlightening. Um, I, I have very much the same worry. Um, Speaking of David Brooks, David and I did an event uh, before the debate at Washington University in 2016. Um, and it was actually in a chapel. Uh, it was for the Danforth Center there. And um, uh, in the course of the talk, um, I said, um, you know, if I had a hat, uh, like Donald Trump's hat, my hat would say, make America empathetic again. Um, and at the end of it, this lovely man came up to me and said, I love that, and you're going to hear from me. And about three weeks later, an absolutely perfect replica of the Trump hat arrived in the mail that said, make America empathetic. And you wear that hat? Well, that's, it's funny that you ask, because I love the hat. But my son, who happened to be home at that, at that time, looked at that and said, Dad, that's awesome. Except it looks so much like the Trump hat that you can't wear it because <laughs> beyond five feet, people will think you're wearing a Trump hat. So I, uh, I hope someday that we have a circumstance in the country where I can wear. Uh, It'll become an important historical artifact. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I am, um, I am obsessed in a way with empathy and our difficulties in mustering it. Um, and you know, it take two. Uh, uh, people uh, or families, um, probably on very different sides of our politics, uh, in principle, it should not be difficult for a white person to empathize with an African-American parent who is petrified that their unarmed 16-year-old son might get shot by the cops. That really should not be difficult for us. I've thought of this when Black Lives Matter started, you know, that I've had, we have three teenage kids. I know teenagers. Uh, I, you know, I do not, I did not have to worry as a white parent uh, that if, uh, you know, my son was driving too fast in a car uh, or something went on, that he'd be shot by a cop. But this parent actually does. Uh, similarly, imagine a white man in Flint, Michigan, or Reading, Pennsylvania, or Erie, Pennsylvania, or my hometown of Fall River, uh, who had worked really hard all his life and thought he made a deal with the economic system that if he worked really hard, he'd make enough money to be able to support his family and retire with some decency. Um, not looking for a lot, but looking for that. And then suddenly, the global economy and the Great Recession pulls that whole rug out from under you, and suddenly you're looking at working for half or a quarter or, or a third of what you worked for before. Um, you've got no pension. You don't know what your retirement is going to look like. Is it so hard to understand why that person is really angry? Maybe angry enough to vote for Donald Trump, uh, even if you think, if I would say to him, I don't think that's the most effective vote you can cast, but I sure get why that guy is mad. Um, and so I long for politicians who can kindle that uh, in us. I've noticed, because it was the 50th anniversary of uh, Martin Luther King's death, uh, a lot of people have gone back to that Robert Kennedy speech uh, the night the King was killed. Uh, you know, my brother was killed by a white man. Uh, and I looked at Kennedy as a figure who really succeeded in talking about all across the very same divide we're talking about so much now, white working class Americans and African Americans. Um, and you know, some of us probably romanticize Bobby Kennedy a bit. I'm probably guilty of that, because I'm a, I'm a fan of his, uh, a deep fan of his. 
Um, but it is the objective, and, and, and he showed in 1968 that it was possible. Barack Obama actually, in his first campaign especially, managed to speak across some of those lines. Bill Clinton managed to speak across uh, some of those lines. On the Republican side, Dwight Eisenhower actually spoke quite effectively across uh, those lines. So we ought to be able to do it. So uh, again, I'm a philisiopath. I haven't given up. Um, and I just, I guess I do believe that there, um, there is a decency in us as Americans. You know, I, I always say my favorite line on Americans is the Winston Churchill line, Americans always do the right thing after first exhausting all of the other possibilities. <laughs> we just happen right now to be doing one heck of a job of exhausting all of the other uh, possibilities. But it's happened before, so I think it can happen again. Dick and then. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess uh, I'm uh, a, uh, a teacher at the uh, School of Theology and History, the predecessor of Mark has been. I have a question. You talked about the uh, evangelical leadership being pro-Trump. You talked about the evangelical support that he gets from a number of, of uh, ministers and a number of uh, evangelicals. And I wondered if you saw a way for American Catholic bishops to uh, to, de to maybe to raise a kind of voice, or if there's a strategy they should adopt that could be helpful uh, for the civic life. Because they have talked at times about religious liberty in a way that is troubling, at least to some people. Uh, and I wonder if you have any suggestions how they might uh, speak uh, as a kind of counter voice to some of the more ardent uh, evangelical support that uh, Trump has gained. Yeah, so two problems I see and two hopes I have on that question. Um, problem one is that the bishops are very, very clearly divided on these matters. Uh, and I think that um, the evidence of that division, the stark evidence of that division, was when Cardinal Supic, uh, representing what we'll call, for lack of a better term, the more progressive side of the church, uh, was defeated uh, when he ran to be chair of the pro-life committee of the uh, yeah of the of the conference of bishops, it was a close vote. Uh, the close vote tells me that if Francis gets a few more appointments, the majority will share. It, it was twenty-one votes. <coughs> no, but I think I, it was not quite twenty-one. I think it, my, my, I think it was like sixteen because I counted if you okay. shifted eight votes to go the other way. I was just okay. trying to see how long it would be before the majority changed. But you know, to reject a cardinal that had not happened before. Uh, and, you know, so that the bishops themselves, there's some real divisions among our, um, yeah, I say as a Catholic, our leaders um, right now. Um, you know, and, you know, because of that, I think that um, a very significant part of the church, uh, and the church's leadership, still believes that um, issues such as abortion and gay marriage trump all the others. Now, for those of us as old as you and I are, if you don't mind my saying that, um, uh, we, our memories go back, say, to the 1980s, uh, when that wasn't the case of the leadership of the church, when you know, we had the vision of Cardinal Bernadine, uh, of a seamless garment uh, approach where opposition to abortion was closely linked with opposition to the death penalty, a concern about poverty, uh, a concern for war as a, a belief that war should be a last resort. Um, the bishops put out two remarkable letters uh, in the 1980s on economic justice uh, and on war and peace that the good Father Brian Hare, another great Massachusetts speaker, uh, played an important role uh, in producing. Um, that's kind of the Francis Church. That is the Supich and Tobin, I think uh, largely uh, uh, Cardinal O'Malley um, Bishop McElroy Church, uh, but I, I so so I worry about the divisions, and I worry that there are still people in the leadership of the church who, for their own principal reasons, but they I happen to disagree with them, yeah. um, resist that direction. On the other hand, I have hope a because of Pope Francis, b uh, because I think the rising voices in the church right now are trying to restore. Um, the sort of, if you will, the vision uh, of the 1980s restore and update uh, to the current moment. And that approach to faith's public role 
um, could be a powerful counter voice. And now, just one more point, in fairness to the bishops, they are speaking out quite forcefully on immigration. Um, now, if we're honest, I think both evangelicals and Catholics have a powerful self-interest in doing this, given the importance of the Latino community to both the Catholic Church and evangelicals. So there is clearly some self-interest here. But I think that witness is real. Um, and that is the one issue that does seem to pull together, if you will, the right end and the left end uh, of the bishops' conference. Um, in principle, they have united with other coalitions to fight against certain um, social service cuts and the like. Um, but I think we've got to get over some of these divisions. But there is a model there of the church doing this. Um, and then we have to look for what currently is a minority in the evangelical leadership that's willing uh, to speak out. But Trump got uh, the highest, I mean, it wasn't by a lot more points than Romney or McCain, but he did get the highest percentage of the white evangelical. Yeah, if, if anything, I would say that the evangelicals are more committed to this than the Catholic yeah. bishops. Yeah. Who was one of the major evangelical leaders said that regarding the Sixth Commandment, we've given Mr. Trump a mulligan. You know, yeah. Right. So, so it's like, you know, well, we'll just we'll forget that. Well, Catholics are, uh, and we are fundamentally a 50-50 yeah. group right now, yeah. as you know, Catholics yeah. overall. Usually Catholics vote for the winner. Uh, and some people would say that's the Holy Spirit. It might have something to do with demographics. Uh, you know, the very nature of the diversity of the church, around 10% African American, we're about a third Latino. Um, and uh, this time there's some debate over what the actual number uh, was, but we were pretty close to 50-50 in this election. Catherine. Um, I want to get back to truth and lies. My name is Catherine Cornell. I'm in the theology department oh, here. Thank you for being here. Um, so uh, yesterday I heard on the radio a new technology that uh, was developed where the voices of uh, anyone can, can be used to say anything. You know, so it's scary, isn't it? It is, and, and to me that's, that's the biggest worry. How do we control facts in this democracy? And how, I mean, journalism must be in a terrible, you know, under terrible pressure to constantly correct facts or how, how do you envision the future of journalism with this incredible technology that can manipulate anything? You know, I, I heard about that technology and uh, I thought about it and I said, you know, I wonder what a pro-Trump speech would sound like in my voice, you know, if I did that. <laughs> and suddenly Let's I stop heard, for a moment and imagine myself. that, I would love that. <laughs> I hear myself saying it's these things, it would be, and it seems now, uh, possible. Um, or, I mean, I suppose we could also have fun and turn Donald Trump into a democratic socialist, and that would be interesting <laughs> to listen to as well. Um, um, no, it's very, it's very scary. I mean, uh, with journalism right now, it's a very odd moment because um, it's another case of, pardon the Dickensian cliche, the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, because on the one hand, there are economic pressures uh, on journalism that are they're making it very difficult, particularly, by the way, um, for what had been really good, thriving local papers uh, that did a lot of really good reporting, both around the world and in their communities and um, in Washington. And those institutions are in a lot of trouble. Um, it's, on the other hand, a very good time for the Washington Post, for the New York Times, for certain national uh, newspapers uh, where our circulations because of online are going up. Um, the Washington Post claims we made a profit. Uh, New York Times stock, I, 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 I say that not to um, say I doubt what my own newspaper says, only that I don't know how they figure it out and the books are closed because it's not a public company anymore. But I, so I'll let, let's just say we made a profit. The, the New York Times stock is as high as it's been in a long time and I can say that because New York Times had an excellent stock plan. I kept a lot of it. It went down to seven uh, from 50, and now it's back up to 25. So something, uh, you know, something is going on um, with us, and you know, we are adding at Post. We're adding reporters. We're doing all kinds of cool stuff, um, and uh, so that's you know that's a good thing. But there are those you know pressures and counter pressures, and then there. But there is the big question of who chooses to read and consume what? Right. Um, you know, one of the reasons I love getting hate mail is it means 
contrary to what's happening where people are ignoring those they disagree with, at least people who disagree with me are reading me. Uh, you know, I, I, we, we need more of that. You know, more, we need more people reaching out for views that aren't theirs. So, you know, God bless them if they want to write an angry letter. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, the, the, I worry that the fact checking doesn't always catch up with the error, especially if you're not looking for it, especially if you're living more or less in a particular cocoon, and if Facebook or some other social media tend to send you to people you agree with, uh, as opposed to people uh, you disagree with. They, they want you to be happy. They don't want you angry. Uh, so, you know, they will send liberals to me and, you know, right-wingers to, you know, uh, I don't know, Laura Ingram. Um, and, you know, that, that is troubling what we're doing now. And then you think about it, um, you know, I, 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 I could be very Clintonian on this. I can argue, going back to the parody of Fort Bill, um, I can actually easily take opposite views on the current circumstance. Because on the one hand, I'm very excited about what all this can do. On my phone, I can read newspapers from all over the world. Uh, I can get data instantly that I couldn't get before. I can fact check when I hear something, and or worse, when I say something and discover <laughs> I'm wrong. I can, get, I can fact check myself right away. Um, and it's amazing what you can do with technology and the access that we all have on our little phones that we never had before. So I'm not a Luddite. Uh, on the other hand, I uh, worry very much about the sort of enclosure and that if you don't look, if you don't want to be contradicted, if you don't want to know the facts are wrong, you can live there a lot more easily. And lastly, I just worry about the decline in the number of people, particularly covering state and local government. That just happens to be a, uh, I, call, I covered uh, state government once upon a time and have affection for that work. I think it's important. And there's just a whole lot less money going into that, and a lot fewer people doing it. That just really concerns me as part of this. So I don't know where, I, I, I suppose we will have uh, um, technologies that will uh, tell us quickly, yes or no, this is made up. But imagine this at the end of a campaign, the temptation to have your opponent saying something dreadful, uh, and how, well, how you catch up with it, that line that the lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its shoes on. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can speed up the truth process technologically, but the lie's already out there. Mm -hmm. You you were gonna come in. You you were Yeah, I was just gonna ask, um, following on that point then, um, Oh, identify yourself as a future Oxford student. <laughs> I just learned today. Yeah, I'm Julia, I'm a sophomore, um, and I work at the Blasey Center. Um, I was just wondering, so if we're if the problem lies in choosing our news sources, but we all come from our own partisan viewpoints, how do we choose, um, like how do we go through those news sources and choose which other side to view when we're all typecasting the opposing party as promulgating lies? So if I, as a Democrat, want to read the other side, but my entire party is, is casting, I mean Fox, which is an extreme example, um, as inaccurate and completely biased, then how do I choose, how do I sift through those sources and choose what to listen to? You know, that, that, I like your question. I actually think it would be intriguing for a group of, uh, say, 10 people to sit down together, 10 people on the right and 10 people on the left, uh, with range of view within right and within left. Uh, to say, what are 10 reasonably trustworthy mm -hmm. sources of opinion that do not completely distort the facts? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I am a regular reader in my side. I read National Review a lot. I read the Weekly Standard. Uh, once in a while, I read First Things. Um, or Brave Man. Yeah, <laughs> I said once in a while. The, uh, uh, God bless the memory of Father Newhouse. I once said, by the way, to Mike Novak that um, that he and Father Newhouse uh, persuaded me to many of the views I now hold, which in most cases are views they now reject, yeah, but they, that's, uh, <laughs> they had convergence. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm um, you know, there are a lot of conservative columnists I read in respect of. I mean, you know, the fact is most of the ones I like best are anti-Trump. Uh, but um, you know, I think it is possible 
to find uh, opinion that is at least reasonably rooted in fact that you disagree with. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably being, I'm sure I'm leaving out, uh, I'm sure that to, to pick uh, the National Review and the Weekly Standard is probably elitist of me in some ways. I'm sure there's other conservative opinion, uh, a lot of other conservative opinion. I look at commentary sometimes. Uh, still, I subscribe to it off and on. Um, and I disagree with these folks a lot. But there are, you know, I think of, I, I have a lot of, I mean, I'm so old that I have conservative friends because I predate the time when we were supposed to hate each other. Uh, so I, um, you know, there are a lot of conservative friends I engage in. I have one friend we get together periodically just to make see if one of us has gone off the rails. You know? <laughs> and that's uh, part of our function with each other. Um, so it can be done, but it's an interesting challenge. Why, can you talk more about what you're getting at? Because I think it's a really interesting question. Um, Good op ed pages, by the way, ought to provide you with reasonable and factual argument from a bunch of sides. That is the purpose of a good op-ed page. If you look at the post, we've added a ton of columnists online, which uh, you know who often run in the paper paper. Um, and I think newspapers could actually begin to provide uh, those fora where you get exposed to views you disagree with. Um, you know, kind of one-stop shopping, as well as views you might more agree with more. And I think that is part of the job of the, what is left of the old media, to present people with factually based thoughtful opinion. But it, go ahead, I just, I found that a really interesting question. Um, I guess from like a non-expert or a young point of view, um, it's hard to tell what's, what's a, it, often hard to tell what's a fact and what's an alternative fact. Um, and if you're looking at, if you come into viewing news sources from a strictly liberal lens, then shifting over to both sides um, makes it hard, I think, to distinguish between what's a new take on the facts and what's an alternative fact. Um, so, I don't know, I think that it's hard, especially when all advertising is so biased, to um, get a good sense of what what is partisan and what is um, just false. <laughs> no, I think it's a good point. I mean, when is a take so fresh and interesting because it's actually not based on the facts and therefore <laughs> can be completely unmoored and uh, you know seem very intriguing because, uh, for that reason? I mean, I think that uh, um, you know, I think the whole concept of hot takes now is. Uh, fascinating, and what is the, uh, um, I, I'm sort of, uh, I have a, an interest in the next uh, month to, uh, to think about what does hot take mean? Why has that <laughs> phrase taken off in the last couple of years? Uh, what is it about the moment that you demand a hot take? Um, I, I, I particularly like hot take in, takes in sports coverage, uh, but they're pretty harmless in sports coverage. Um, but you know, I, I want to think about it because and there are people talking about how uh, to create opportunities for people to get exposed to views they disagree with on a more regular basis. And I do think it's, uh, I do think it's a useful thing. Maybe you could make that a project for your senior thesis. Um, I've read, it's, it's a, it's a great you. subject. Sorry, I just want to um, answer Julie's question in a much less theoretical and much less thoughtful way, which is just to say, oh, excuse me, I'm Kay Schlossman. I'm a professor of a long time in the political science department. But you came here when you were 10, right? So what? You were 10 when you arrived here. That's right, I was 10. Okay. Have you taught a brilliant student? Is she one of your students? Oh, no, no. But what I'm going to say, say is that Schlossman. the political science department is quite diverse ideologically. Yes. And I won't name names in public, but I'm <laughs> happy to tell you who can give you a thoughtful answer, who um, might disagree with you, some places to, to look. So that's not a, a kind of Interesting yeah, answer, true. but it is a it is a concrete answer, and I'd be happy to help you. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, do you have the we'll give Kathy the last word oh, here. Well, I just want to say and I want to hear you one time speak with contempt. You know, I never heard that before. I was on ninety five today. There's a lot of contempt right in that <laughs> directed against my fellow. Introduce yourself. Um, Kathy Caveney, I'm in the law school in the theology department. And I'm just so happy to be at BC, and also happy to welcome EJ here because. 
I've learned so much from him, uh, you know, from his incisiveness and charity, charitableness. That's a combination that you don't see very much, and, and, and EJ has embodied it as long as I've known him. Here's my question. It might be back to BC, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you, Kathy. Thank you. It's true. Um, speculate on this. I've been picking up something. I've talked to Mark about it, a couple of people around here, some of my students. And I wonder if I'm imagining this new thing or if I'm just, you know, projecting it or if it's actually there. And this is... Um, See, in the new media world, you can't really tell. It's just I know, sort of so groundless hot take. You know. you know, the whole point about contempt as, as tr sort of wanting to, you know, seeing people as vile and wor worthless, what I've seen is in some students and in some of the commentary around a sense of, well, why should we try to be one nation? Let's go back to a new kind of federalism where you know the states have more power. So if you want to be in Indiana and ban gay marriage and keep women down, maybe Indiana's not the right choice. A state I shall leave unnamed. Uh, and, and or if you want to live in a blue state like Massachusetts and 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 and, and you know live in a certain way, you can do it. We should. Uh, basically kind of divide, have a separation, a divorce, like the people in California, you know, the study The conscious of uncoupling. The conscious uncoupling, like, you know, like <laughs> Gwyneth and, and Chris Martin did. And we it didn't work out great, by the way, in 1861. Well, know, and that's that. the problem, right? You know, that, that, the, the Civil War has stopped us from doing this, but I see this concern in theological worlds for this new integralism. We know we're going to have a country, you know, a, a, a government that, that really reflects our values all the way down. The only way you could do that here would be to go back to kind of like state or quasi-state things and, and, and move away from a, a unified vision of what the country is about. And have, have you seen any em emphasis on this? Do you think this is a way that some people will respond to the situation by saying, let's break up amicably, have a common defense, but Peoria doesn't need to be New York and you should be able to choose where you want to live? Um, i tell you where we saw it. Uh, immediately after the election, and it turned out that the Russians were giving support to it. And it was liberals in California. Uh, you know, California has seen it on both sides. On the one side, uh, you know, a very small group of liberals in California say maybe we should go it alone. We got huge GDP, we got good values. Yeah. The, you know, the rest of the country elected that guy, we don't need this. Uh, and it turned out the Russians were actually supporting some of this movement. And then within California, you have a movement to say, well, uh, interior California is completely different from these liberal coastal elites. Let's split California uh, and into at least two states. Uh, so there is a lot of that. I mean, that's just one yeah, example. So there is some of this, we just can't get along uh, anymore. I mean, the problems are, A, I don't think it's going to happen. B, the problems are legion because if you look at so-called uh, Trump states or so-called Clinton states, they are themselves so uh, internally divided. New York, Metro New York is very, voted very differently from upstate. Metro Chicago voted very differently from downstate. Illinois, here in Massachusetts, um, you know, in uh, where we're so democratic that Hillary won pretty quite easily. Nonetheless, you saw trends toward the Democrats in Cambridge, Wellesley, uh, you know, Needham, Newton, Boston, and tw trends away from the Democrats in Fall River, New Bedford, Lowell, Lawrence, Haverhill. Um, you know, I could be wrong about one of those, but I don't think so. It was really a split between the old factory towns uh, and wealthier uh, Boston. So as a practical matter, uh, it can't work. Um, without sort of cutting us up into really tiny pieces. Um, and so then the question is, what is the alternative going to be? Now, um, this is not a good thing for someone my age to say, uh, but the fact of the matter is a lot of this will go away when my generation disappears. Uh, that if you look at the attitudes of people over 65, uh, and look at the attitudes of people, especially under 45, they are really different. In Alabama, um, um, you know, Doug Jones got 61% of the vote of the under 45s uh, in Alabama in that race with Roy Moore, whereas Roy Moore carried the over 65s 
by a good margin. Now, as I told my kids, I want to see the change you guys are going to make in this country, but I want to be around for it. And my whole theory kind of operates against uh, that. Um, and so I think that um, generational change will ease this transition. Uh, the average age, last I looked, the average age of Fox News was 68 years old. Um, you know, there is a radical difference in the attitudes of uh, millennials and uh, the over 65s uh, in the country. Uh, and I think some of the trouble we're having is there really are a lot of older Americans uh, who really worry that the country doesn't look like it did when they were young. And it doesn't. I mean, and and that, and and I don't say that contemptuously of them. I don't. I say that with some understanding, because no matter how liberal or progressive you claim to be, there are still small things you revere and like and don't want to see disappear. Now, some of it is the racial change. Some of it is religious change. The rise of the non-believing millennials. Um, you know, and so a lot of people are uncomfortable uh, about what the country is becoming. That's why Robbie Jones is. The End of White Christian America book is so interesting. Um, uh, but I think that um, we are going to pass to something somewhat different and somewhat less divided, uh, even if we do nothing. Uh, that's the worst case. The better case is that this experience will actually bring us together. And I'm struck that Donald Trump, except for Rasmussen, it's been at 35 to 40 percent in the polls. The vast majority of Americans don't like this experiment, and the big ch the, Trump won the election not because the, 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 even the 46 percent are Trumpists, but because for a whole variety of reasons, a lot of people wanted to vote against Hillary Clinton. Uh, some of it's sexism, some of it's I'm sick of the Clintons, some of it was um, you know the server and all the rest of it. Whatever it was. Um, there was, uh, I, if I got these numbers right in my head, I think 17% of the electorate had an unfavorable view of both Clinton and Trump, and they voted 4730 for Trump. Those aren't Trump people. Uh, and so I think in the end, we're not going to go all the way down uh, this road, and that's the better case uh, scenario. And sometimes when you experiment with something and decide it doesn't work, that puts an end to it for a while. So I guess I'll close by saying, I think I disagree with my friend on David Brooks, and I'm I glad think we can come back from yeah. this. And that I'm proving Peggy Steinfeld's right. I really am a Felicio Pat. Bless you all for That's coming. That's good. Thank you. Thank you.